Good evening, dear friends. So welcome to our traditional webinar we provide in the end of each year. So during the webinar, we usually discuss very important topics of transplantation activity, of transplantation approach. And uh, what is the most important, we answer all your questions. So dear friends, I am very happy to see you. And I would like to see Anastasia. She is coming. Oh, hello, Anastasia. How are you? Good. Hi, nice doctor. to see you. Nice to see you. And nice to uh, see you too. dear friends, welcome again. And Anastasia, welcome. And we have our traditional webinar today. And we have two parts of this webinar. First one is my report. Uh, two, two weeks ago, I was invited to Scotland uh, for AIMS meeting and to discuss the most important topics of transplantation for multiple sclerosis patients. And we had very beautiful conference. I met lots of our friends, Richard Bird from Chicago and European leaders. And what is the most important, lots of our friends, patients from the UK and other countries who took part in this event. But after this uh, report, I received lots of requests to repeat and to discuss this important information during our webinar. So first part is my report. It will take around 20 minutes. And second part is our traditional session, questions and answers. So uh, dear friends, let's start with our presentation. Да. Let's start with our presentation. So the topic of presentation is modern concept of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for multiple sclerosis based on Pirogov Sancho experience. I am going to discuss the following question. Rationale for the use transplantation for patients with multiple sclerosis, some methodological issues. First, what means effective treatment of multiple sclerosis? Why HECT is highly effective here? What protocol is the most suitable in MS patients? And is this treatment safe? What patient is the best candidate for transplantation? What is the best time for transplantation? How to make the right decision? What are the long-term results of HECT? And is HECT effective for progressive variants of MS? And how to provide the optimal support of transplantation and some words about our perspectives. You know, Maximov Department of Hematology and Cellular Therapy, this is Government University Hospital. It's true to say that for today we have the biggest single center experience in HECT for multiple sclerosis in the world. Totally, we have provided more than 2,000 transplantation for autoimmune diseases, mainly for multiple sclerosis. So we use traditional Russian medical school combined patient communication and uh, research and modern science. Also, we are a member of European bone marrow transplantation group, and we used to uh, promote patient-oriented approach in our treatment. So the next topic is what means effective treatment of multiple sclerosis? This is quite important for understanding and why HECT is highly effective. Firstly, we need to ask two main questions. Is it possible to cure MS and is it possible to prevent disability? These questions are addressed to neurological society. This question is about traditional treatment of multiple sclerosis and the answer is impossible. And why? Because all disease-modified drugs are not able to eliminate autoreactive T and B lymphocytes clones. On the other hand, what means effective MS treatment? So effective MS treatment means to stop MS progression for a long period, to prevent irreversible CNS damage, and to improve significantly neurological deficit for long period, so to improve patient's quality of life. On the other hand, not effective treatment is aimed to decreasing rate of inflammation, number of size of lesions, decreased number of relapses. So we can see that HECT works in 
area of effective treatment. All traditional medication works in area of non-effective treatment. So it's clear that principally new approach is needed. And this new, new old approach is treatment intensification. Treatment intensification is based on increase of summary dose, dose intensification, and decreasing of interval between doses. So transplantation is like a hit. Chemotherapy concentration is time and dose. High dose for short period of time is a principle of uh, lymphoablative conditioning. This is the principle of transplantation. So, but another important issue is area of toxicity. We should avoid this area because this area is very dangerous. We need to get into area with the best balance between effectiveness and toxicity. This is area of lymphoablative transplantation. So, now it's quite clear that transplantation is very effective because using this approach, we can effectively eliminate autoreactive T and B lymphocytes clones. No other technologies can do it. So another important question, what should we do? What protocol we should use to provide the best possible treatment? So we can see traditional our traditional scheme of transplantation with key points when we can improve effectiveness of transplantation. These key points are stem cell mobilization, high-dose immunosuppression, monoclonal antibodies, and early and late post-transplant care. And we can see evolution our program from F, uh, to improve effectiveness and better result, to reach better result. For example, stem cell changing these key points. Stem cell mobilization from chemotherapy with colony stimulating factors to stimulation with steroids. High dose immunosuppression with, from beam and beam-like conditioning to cyclophosphamide and cyclophosphamide and fludarabine-based program. Monoclonal antibodies, we came from ATG to rituximab, and early and late post-transplant care from watch and wait approach to personalized approach to rehabilitation, consolidation, and supportive therapy in some cases. So, and toxicity of our program is quite suitable. You can see it here. The most common side effects were infection, mild hepatic toxicity, some neurological deterioration in the beginning. So transplantation-related mortality, which is quite important, was 0.20.5%. This is for old protocols, and which is quite important, 0% for new protocol we started three years ago. So it's true to say that transplantation approach is very safe. Another issue. What patient is the best candidate for HECT? Our long-term result. We analyzed uh, more than 500 patients with long-term follow-up. Patient characteristic is here. And uh, you can see patient characteristic, and our result shows this is event-free survival, relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis to compare with progressive variant. We can see that event-free survival for relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis was much better to compare with progressive variants of MS. Also, event-free survival for patients with disease duration less than five years was much higher, significantly higher to compare with longer disease cause. And event-free survival for patients younger 30 years old was much better to compare with older patients. 
So factors which improve event-free survival, the picture of the best candidate for transplantation are early transplantation, we discuss it later, younger age, shorter disease duration, and relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. Also, we analyze some other factors. We found that presence of active lesions before transplantation, gender, ITG, using quality of life before transplantation do not influence on event-free survival. The next topic is what is the best time for HECT? How to make a right decision? I think this is one of the most important topics here. Lots of patients ask about when to apply for this treatment. And the concept of transplantation depending on the disease stage and disability was developed in our center. There are three strategies. First strategy is early transplantation, is provided in the beginning of MS. For patients with early disease cause, with low disability level, and the goal of this treatment is to prevent patient's progression, patient's disability, to improve patient's quality of life and to stop the disease progression in early stage of the disease. The most common transplantation is conventional transplantation, is provided in mid-stage of MS for patients with moderate disability. And the goal is to prevent the disease progression in patients with some damage, to stop further progression and to improve patient's quality of life. And quite difficult solution is salvage transplantation is provided as an advanced stage of the disease in patients with high disability level, seven and higher. It's important to make right decision here to carefully assess balance between possible risks and benefits. It's important to understand that this high disability level can be treated only if patient has active inflammation. And the goal of this approach is to stop the disease progression in patients with irreversible neural damage, with significant loss of functions, to save patient from complete disability and to improve severely declined quality of life. So, and treatment decision it's quite important, should be made together with patients. This is patient-oriented approach. And treatment decision should be made based on clinical data, traditional neurological assessment and general medical examination we provide in the beginning in our hospital, and patient reported outcomes like quality of life and symptoms assessment. So when we assess our result, our Result should be based on both clinical data, neurological assessment, and patient reported outcomes also, quality of life analysis and symptoms profile. So, uh, analyzing our approach, we can see that event-free survival for early transplantation is much better to compare with conventional and salvage transplantation. So it's true to say the earlier we do this treatment, the better. And quality of life in early transplantation group improved significantly in one year after transplantation. We can see a red diagram before transplantation and gray one in one year after we reach population norm. Keeping this position during three years follow-up. In Salvage and transplantation group quality of life also improved, but less, not reaching the population norm. On this diagram, we can see symptom frequency before transplantation in and in one year and more after HECT. We can see that 10 moderate to severe symptoms decreased in one year and later after transplantation. So it's quite important. Patients started to have much less symptoms in 12 months and later. And another important topic, lots of patients ask about it. Is transplantation effective for progressive variants of MS? What are 
the long-term outcomes of HECT. There are a lot of discussion between a relationship of inflammation and neurodegeneration. Almost 15 years ago, it was postulated that patients with primary and secondary progressive multiple sclerosis also have active inflammation in brain and spine. Transplantation causes to complete control of immune-mediated inflammation and resetting of the immune system with restoration of self-tolerance to autoantigen. So it's possible to imagine that transplantation can be effective in all patients who have inflammation. And our results, our long-term results, confirm it. We can see long-term results of relapsing remittent group. After transplantation, the vast majority of patients were relapse-free. In three years of tra after transplantation, relapse-free survival was more than 90%. In five years, more than 80%, and in seven years, 83% of patients were disease-free. Another picture is progressive-free survival of secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. The results are also impressive. After two years, more than 80% of patients were progressive-free. More than 80% after three years and seven years after transplantation, 76.5% of secondary progressive MS patients were progressive free. So it's true to say that results are quite impressive. Also, we can see that quality of life improved as well as relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis as in progressive multiple sclerosis in one year after transplantation. So, another important topic I'm going to discuss, how to provide the optimal support of HECT. The rules of success are based on multidimensional approach and specialist cooperation. This is complete comprehensive pre-transplant examination using modern equipment, medical data, neurological assessment, general medical examination, quality of life and symptoms assessment. Before starting treatment, it's quite important to analyze all risk factors like patient-based factors, disease-based factors, and treatment-based factors. So we need to see, to assess prognosis, possible effects and possible risks before starting treatment. And the next step is making decision together with patient. It's quite important. This is patient-oriented approach we follow in our hospital. So preparation to HECT is also quite important. Infection screening, local infection treatment, and good symptoms control. After all these positions, we can start HECT safely. Another rule of success is cooperation with all specialists during treatment. We are in cooperation with neurolog neurologists, psycho physiotherapists, nutritionologists, psychologists, cardiologists, and other specialists for indication. This is positive thing to provide treatment in university hospital. So it's quite important to have aseptic intensive care unit rooms for indications for severe infection, for example. Good supportive treatment during neutropenic phase, symptoms control, bowel dysfunction treatment, infections control, psychological support, nutritional support, and physiotherapy in neutropenic phase are extremely important. So the most important thing in during treatment is timely diagnosis and prevention of and treatment of complications. And final rule of success is good supportive treatment after transplantation. This is, it includes proper rehabilitation, lifestyle changes, psychological support, risk factors of relapse or progression assessment, and good symptoms control. So, and I would like to tell some words about our perspectives. 
We are develop, developing in our hospital. First is CAT therapy. There are lots of discussion about CAT therapy. We are developing this approach, but only future and future results will show effectiveness of this approach in multiple sclerosis. I think we need at least five years to be sure that this treatment is very effective, but this approach is quite perspective. Also transplantation in combination with cellular therapy, this is future. Combination of transplantation with intrathecal immunotherapy or chemotherapy, we use this approach for people who need second transplantation. Consolidation therapy for some cases. Development of treatment modalities for people with relapse or progression. New approaches for early and late post-transplant rehabilitation is quite perspective direction, like we are virtual reality technologies, uh, locomat technologies, so tandem transplantation and new lymphoblative protocols. So we can see an example of our new lymphoblative protocol. We started three years ago. This is a six-day program based on cyclophosphamide and fludarabine. First result, confirm effectiveness and high safety profile of this treatment program. And as another, uh, another example of new uh, approaches is development of treatment modalities for people who relapsed or progressed after transplantation. This is second transplantation option. So we use another conditioning regimen in combination with intrathecal chemotherapy or immunotherapy. So we give systemic chemotherapy Combine it with chemotherapy through the lumbar puncture, sending chemotherapy directly to central nerve system. So, dear friends, uh, that's all from me, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am ready to answer questions related to my report and to discuss other questions. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you, doctor. It's Thank you. again so interesting, so helpful, like always. So, dear friends, just in case I wanted to say again, hi, big hug from Moscow. Thank you for your time, for your attention, who could find that uh, to take part and join us. I hope you like it, <laughs> that time with us. We are happy <laughs> to do our work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anastasia. I think presentation can be a little bit difficult for understanding for not specialists, but we covered uh, some important issues. Uh, it helps a lot to understand when we need to do transplantation, what protocol is best to use, and how we need to organize effective and what is the most important safe treatment. So we are ready to discuss our questions which came from our friends. Mm -hmm. Yes, I totally agree with you. And uh, we are lucky. We have already uh, <laughs> our friends who want to ask some questions. And uh, I'm sure all questions are very interesting all the time. And uh, first, our um, lady, she was with us a few years ago. She has had already treatment in our hospital. And uh, Laura wants to ask doctor just more questions, maybe more details for other people. And she helps a lot new people who want to come and get uh, transplantation. Okay, welcome, Laura. So we are waiting. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, nice to see you. And you. Hi, Dr. Federenko. Hi, Anastasia. It's so good to see you again. And thank you, Dr. Federenko, for coming to our AIMS conference a couple of uh, weeks ago. It was amazing. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you for inviting me here tonight. <clears throat> I'm here as a trustee of AIMS charity who um, we signpost and provide information for people who are looking at, at HSCT as a treatment option. And we have collated a list of standard questions that 
our supporters would would like us to ask. So these are quite generic questions. Obviously, you've gone through a lot of detail um, tonight about the medical side of things. So the questions I'm going to ask are more around things like how much does it cost? How long are your waiting lists? How long will I be away from home? Of course, I know the answer to these questions, but we're asking on behalf of others. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. So, yes, uh, uh, you are right. Organizing questions are very important. So, uh, the price of transplantation is the same, not high, it's around 50,000. So, uh, our waiting list isn't very long now, it's around two, three months. And so, as previously, we provide quick hospitalization for patients. Uh, who have very uh, urgent indication for this treatment with highly active or aggressive multiple sclerosis, of course, we provide hospitalization without uh, waiting list. So, but it's important to understand that treatment in Moscow is quite safe now. There are no any difficulties. Oh, only one complication. There are no any direct fly. So other things are the same. So we have all opportunities to provide uh, good effective treatment, all equipment, all medications, so no problems with payment, we organize invitations, so and uh, support of patients during all steps being in Moscow. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and um, You're what welcome. is the process day by day whilst someone's at the facility with you? Okay, I think I would like to address this answer to Anastasia, but first is, uh, I think, visit our website, HCT Russia. So, and first step is application form to make decision about uh, does patient need this treatment? Uh, we need to see medical results. So this is firstly medical information. Patient needs to fill out application form to send us uh, MRI result, mainly description. So we need to understand what situation is. So Anastasia, maybe you can add something about uh, steps of uh, before uh, transplantation. Uh, oh, I will add. So, when we have medical results, for example, application form, we analyzed and we make decision how soon patient need this treatment. There are two main important thing consideration. First one is urgent transplantation. If patient has quite quick progression or very active multiple sclerosis, we need to do it as soon as possible. This is urgent hospitalization we provide without any waiting list. We have spots for it. And second is conventional transplantation. We can do it step by step. So uh, we have company which provides support and invitation, meeting in the airport and uh, payment support and all other organizations. So are the same like before this complicated situation, no changes, no difficulties. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Uh, next question, please. Your questions are quite useful and important. Okay. Um, are patients likely to encounter any fertility issues after HSCT? Should they consider freezing their sperm eggs or embryos prior to coming over? Yes, it's an important question because uh, uh, Multiple sclerosis is a disease of mainly young patients. So, uh, lymphoablative protocol we use is quite safe and usually doesn't affect on fertility. So, uh, this treatment is safe. But if patient has plans to have children nearest future, we recommend cryopreservation. So uh, the risk to have problem is less than 0.5%. And usually this is a group of people who had fertility problems before chemotherapy. So treatment is quite safe. But to decrease this risk from 0.5 to 0, we recommend to provide cryopreservative things for people who is going to have children in nearest future in one and two years after transplantation because it's possible. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any problems with the language barrier? Um, will patients be able to understand all the staff at the facility? And is there a, a follow-up protocol, you know, vaccination programs, that kind of thing? Okay, so t actually we don't have any language problems in our hospital. Uh, Anastasia helps a lot, so Dr. Anatoly and me can speak English with patients. Also, some of our nurses speak English. Uh, in modern time, we can use uh, mobile translators. So uh, some of our patients uh, who visited our hospital who had treatment, they didn't know English and Russian. They speak speak, uh, for example, Bulgarian or Serbian language, we can use translator to do it quite quickly. Uh, so there are no any serious difficulties. Thank you. Uh, and this is my and, last question. Uh, uh, you ask about language problems and last yes. uh, question I missed. Sorry, could you repeat your last question? Now, the last question is, what other conditions can you treat at your facility with HSCT? Uh, we use modern conditioning, fludarabine and cyclophosphamide-based protocol, and our first result, results show very high effectiveness and safety of this protocol. For some, a neurological uh, autoimmune condition like uh, CIDP, this is the same as multiple sclerosis, but, but with peripheral nerve damage, we, when we can't use fludarabine, we can use the same program, cyclophosphamide 200 mg per kilogram body weight. But for multiple sclerosis, we mainly use fludarabine based protocol because uh, the balance, effectiveness, and safety of this protocol is very high. And we have very big group of patients, more than 200 patients with quite long follow-up. So we have results of uh, more three years of our observation period confirming that this treatment is very effective and safe. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Thank you for very important questions. I think it helps a lot uh, for lots of patients around the world. Thank you. Nice to see you. Have a lovely evening. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm so happy that uh, our patients are still so active and uh, it's really nice uh, to see that we work all together and after treatment, people continue to work and help and share information about treatment. That's really nice. Absolutely that agree. Yeah. And um, th again, thank you so much. And uh, we have another lady uh, who also have some questions. Doctor, hope you're ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, Welcome. Nice. nice. Please, uh, Karen, uh, we are ready to see you and to hear you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Anastasia. Hello, Good Karen. Evening. Hello, Lovely Karen. To nice to you see today. you. I'm also here with my Ames hat on to ask sort of, um, some extra questions for our UK, well, for any patient really. Um, what is the, um, how many patients have you now treated in the last five years at, at your institute? Uh, excuse me, so you mean how many patients? Yeah. Yes. So uh, totally for last 15 years we have treated more than 2000 patients so we have been providing uh, around 200 transplantation every year so i think for the last five years we have treated around uh, 1000 patients excellent um and also, with regard to, you spoke earlier about having a great big multidisciplinary team there and possible complications and the extra specialists and things. Is there any extra cost involved uh, for these um, facilities? Thank you. Very important question. So, uh, multidimensional university hospital is provide the best service because we help we have all specialists, all departments and equipments in one place. And for example, uh, some examples about this 
activity and usefulness of this protocol. For example, if during examination we find that patient needs, for example, thyroid gland examination, uh, nodule biopsy, uh, endoscopy test, colonoscopy test, and additional heart-lung assessment, we can provide it without any additional costs. Also, if we need to provide, if we need to treat complications like infection during this treatment, intensive care unit department, which can be very expensive in other hospitals, uh, patient doesn't need to pay additionally. So uh, sometimes, sometimes it's uh, we had only two cases when patient had to pay additional payment. Uh, it was uh, agreement of patient. This is when we found another disease, another disease, not multiple sclerosis, which had to be treated separately. For example, uh, one hour patient came to our hospital and we found very bad situation with gallbladder and she needed surgery before transplantation because with this situation transplantation can be very dangerous so because we have multi-dimensional multi hospital we asked our surgerist to provide endoscopic cholecystectomy we removed gallbladder provide all surgical service and after 14 days, we started transplantation program. It was one hospitalization. So uh, in this situation, patient needs to pay for surgery. If patient has surgery complication of transplantation, if we provide transplantation for multiple sclerosis and patient has surgery as a result of transplantation, so patient doesn't need to uh, pay additionally. So that's excellent. I've got one last question for you, Dr. Federenko. Um, is there any sort of follow-up procedure with your facility? And um especially sort of post-treatment when I return to my home country? Uh follow-up is quite simple. We recommend to provide some blood tests in one and two weeks and one and three months after transplantation. Also MRI brain and spine with contrast in three, six months time and later annually. And we are in contact with all our friends. So I asked my friends to send me blood results, MRI description, and we give recommendation distantly. So if patient wants to visit our hospital for follow-up, for example, in one in two years, so you are welcome, no problems at all. Uh, also, uh, once or twice a year, we send special questionnaires to assess a quality of life symptoms and to receive information from our friends about condition, about neurological situation, possible MRI results, so we do it every year. So, That's because okay. we need to understand how patient feels after our treatment. So, we are very open and we help our friends uh, during early and late post-transplant period anytime. So, no problems at all. That's wonderful. Thank you ever so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. You too. Bye. Bye. So sweet. Thank you so much, Karen. Nice to see you. And people so many, you know, have so many changes after treatment, have new hair and smiles. It's very nice. Thank you, Karen, again. <laughs> You're absolutely right. It's important to see energy in eyes and smile. This yeah. is one of the good indicators of success after treatment. And questions are very, very, very useful. Thank you. Yeah. Patients are very highly educated about treatment. It's really nice. Uh, so, doctor, anyway, we have to continue. We have, Let's go. Uh, yeah, you have another lady, nice, beautiful lady, Melissa. She wants to ask you some questions. So, please, Melissa, welcome. Hi, thank you. Hello, nice Melissa. And Dr. Federenko, thank you very much uh, for opening up this webinar. I hope that you can hear me okay. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, so my, my, question, my question actually was very similar to the last question that Karen asked you already, which was about um, the follow-up. 
uh, process after treatment. So I am based in England in the UK, and I'm wondering what the relationship between uh, the Pirogov Centre in Moscow will be with my existing uh, neurologist and neurology team uh, in the UK. Will they have access to all of the um, information that was, you know, all of my scans or everything that was done uh, during the treatment there? And uh, yeah, how does that work essentially? Oh, okay. So, of course, the best thing is to be in cooperation with uh, neurological society, with your uh, doctor's team, with your neurologist, with your family doctor. So, we are open and I am ready to uh, discuss your situation anytime using a video call, so using email, any variance with your neurologist, for example, or with your family doctor, or with your hematologist. But follow-up, I want to repeat, follow-up is quite simple. This is total blood count, simple biochemistry test, urine test, four times during first three months, this is early post-transplant period, MRI with contrast and three, six months time and later annually at least five years. And we are open if you send me results. So, for example, if you need to know my opinion, how your results are, uh, I ask my friends, my, our patients to send it to me and I give comments all the time. So, in case of difficulties, we give our recommendations. Also, it's important to understand that when patient leaves our hospital, we give uh, official medical report. Yeah. Stand by our hospital with complete information uh, about all test results, ac uh, accurate treatment description, all recommendation. So, if you give this report in English, of course, if you give this report to your doctor, to neurologist, or hematologist, or family doctor, it's clear what to do. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. You're welcome. Thank you. Nice, doctor. We are very active. <laughs> mm. And continue, I hope, uh, brief, calm, rest. Yes. And we have another question. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Hello, hello. Hello, nice to see you. I am ready. Nice to see you, sir. All right, so 41 years old. Um, I'm on since 2021, June. I've got uh, new symptoms, kind of getting worse. I was diagnosed with RMS, and my latest MRI in June of 2023 showed no newer active lesions. And I'm wondering um, if I'd be a candidate for transplant or not. Okay, very important questions. Did you have MRI brain or brain and spine, so thorax and cervix? So brain and spine, I was done when I was diagnosed, and... There was uh, two lesions in the cervical and a couple lesions in the brain, nothing else in the spine. And my oh, current MRI showed no newer active lesions in the brain or spine. Okay, okay. Oh, look, uh, MRI is limited. Uh, modern approach is uh, based not only on MRI. MRI is limited to detect uh, occult inflammation because okay. lots of modern techniques are coming to analyze occult inflammation. So when we make decision about activity, about uh, our treatment, about transplantation, we need to analyze MRI, neurological status, and your patient reported outcomes. Because some people with MS never have activity on new lesions during MS cause, but they progress right. from good condition to complete disability to wheelchair and was. But okay. all the MRI are stable. So mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't mean that patient doesn't have inflammation. It means that patient has clinically active MS. So okay. MS can be active clinically, like you have radiologically or both. Okay. You have clinically active MS, but why you have symptoms but no new lesions MRI? The explanation okay. is quite simple. MRI can't detect inflammation on cellular level. 
Okay. So, uh, indication for transplantation is clinically and or radiologically active MS. And uh, another important thing, when we received our first results, analyzing big group of patients with long-term follow-up, we compared people who had active and new lesions before transplantation or people who had signs of progression but no new and active lesions on MRI. The positive results are the same. Okay. So, in conclusion, uh, you, if you get involved, it's quite important because when we make decision, we need to assess MRI and your condition. Unfortunately, lots of neurology think about only MS and MRI, but not about patient's condition, patient reported outcomes. But for you, it's much more important how you feel. Right. That's what I, that's what I was thinking as well. Whenever I go see my neurologist, he looks at my MRI report, not even the images, just says, you're fine. There's no new lesions. And I walk in there and I know I'm not fine. I know that I've progressed. So, um, I guess the writing's on the wall. I mean, it's time for something else. Uh, this is why we, uh, during my report, I, uh, you can see that uh, we make decision based on both medical data, MRI, neurological status, and patient reported data. This is quality of life and symptoms. How we assess it? We give special questionnaires, and we receive information directly from patient. This is quality of life and symptoms, your fatigue, your working ability, your emo emotional and psychological situation, your symptoms. And this information came from you because only you know better about, for example, your fatigue or your level of energy, not me, not neurologist. So it's important. Okay. So All right. uh if patient has signs of MS progression, we can provide this treatment in, st in spite of stable MRI. I see. So you'd say that uh, severely increased fatigue is definitely a sign of um, progression? Uh, then... To be honest, fatigue is one of the most common symptoms of MS. Uh, unfortunately, uh, neurological neurologists don't put too much assessment or attention to it. Uh, this is not like fatigue when we have to work hard and when we are tired after a difficult day. Patient with MS wakes up with fatigue. And this yes. fatigue is here after good rest. You have rest, after rest you have fatigue. This is because you have lots of changes inside of your body. And this information is very important because your fatigue affects a lot on your quality of life. If you are tired all time, you are not in good condition. And for you, it's much more important than MRI. Okay. Can I ask one more quick question? Absolutely. So is there a way to have, um, once I apply for treatment at your facility, is there a way to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation to ask some questions before coming down there? Uh, so could you repeat last phrase, please? Yeah, so I'm looking to apply for treatment at your facility, but before coming down there and, and finalizing my plans, is there a way to have a consultation one-on-one -on -one through internet video? Absolutely. Uh, you have contacts. Anastasia is, is responsible for organization, and we can discuss uh, the best time for you and for me, and we can have video call anytime. Uh, no problem. This is quite common practice in our hospital. Consultation is absolutely a good thing okay. before making decision. And then last final question, just to sum it up again. So active inflammation, uh, okay, it's it means go have HSCT or, or, or something, but you can have HSCT without active inflammation and still have good results. Absolutely, but uh, uh, look, you mean HSCT, you have MRI without detectable active inflammation. If you have MS progression and new symptoms, you may have active inflammation, but which isn't detectable on MRI. Look, sometimes patients without active lesions receive steroids. 
and have so, improvement. How to explain? Because steroids only decrease inflammation. So no active lesions on MRI. Uh, doctor gives steroids. Patient has improvement. So it's quite common because some lesions, especially in gray matter or lesions which are very small, less than 0.5, uh, 0 0.3 millimeters can't be detectable on MRI. But a patient has inflammation. It explains your bad condition. Inflammation can be detectable or not detectable. Okay. So this is why transplantation works here. Only one thing when we can wait with transplantation, when patient doesn't have active lesions on MRI, stable in MRI, and no changes in condition. Okay. So stable MRI, stable condition, not necessary. Stable condition during one and more years, not necessary to treat with HCT. We can watch and wait. Gotcha. Changes in MRI, uh, worsening in condition, or both can be indication for this treatment. Okay, thank you very much for your time, doctor. You are welcome. You are welcome. We'll talk soon. Bye. Thank you so much for your questions. Of course, uh, you can apply or maybe just contact with me at first to ask about steps how to do it. It's possible that I arrange with doctor about phone call, about texting message, you no. Know, any contact before coming to make you more calm and uh, when you make maybe decision for yourself that you really want to do transplantation it's not a problem we are really open always and really want to help without rush without um, urgent maybe things if you don't need to do that right doctor <laughs> absolutely right firstly it's quite important to make decision for yourself, for myself, do I need this treatment? Of for course, sure. uh, not alone, family support, relative support is very important here. And from medical side, we will give complete information on how to apply step by step. Actually, I want to repeat, there are no any difficulties to receive this treatment in Moscow now. Yeah, that's right. Maybe I add a little bit. Uh, Russia is open. <laughs> we don't have a problem with visa or our patient get it very easy from any country. We give uh, to everyone invitation and each patient uh, apply in Russia embassy in your country, in your city, and it's quite easy. And uh, just, yes, maybe one not uh, really comfortable thing that... Uh, for example, with Europe, we don't have direct flights for now, but people come through other uh, countries. Uh, we meet at the airport. Our driver will meet you anytime in any airport. And after that, of course, we will meet you in hospital. So just short note to, to this uh, question. So maybe Dr. Another lady, Christina, wants to ask you also another things, another question about treatment. So, okay. welcome. Welcome. Hello, Christina. Nice to see you. Hello, Dr. Fedorenko. Thank you very much for the brilliant consultation. And thank you very much for the work you've done. I think it's just amazing how many lives you saved. You're welcome. Unbelievable. I would like to ask you a question not about MS, but about uh, peripheral neuropathy. Is there any effective treatment for that polyneuropathy? Uh, okay. Uh... Good question. Thank you. It depends on what is the reason of neuropathy. Because some neuropathy can be a result of another condition, like oncological condition or diabetes mellitus or toxins, toxic neuropathy. So transplantation is effective only in case of a condition named CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating neuropathy. This is condition like MS, but uh, in case of MS, immune system attacks central nerve system. In case of autoimmune neuropathy, immune system attacks peripheral nerves. And we have experience in treatment 
CIDP and results are very impressive and good. Success rate is around 80-85%. But what about other neuropathies uh, like toxic uh, endocrine disorders related neuropathies or cancer related neuropathies? In this situation, uh, we need to treat underlying condition. And is there any is there any any treatment except antidepressants which are active now? Uh, for you mean uh, autoimmune neuropathy? No, I mean just in general neuropathy without. Well, it's really hard to find why uh, it happened. Right? Lots it's of treatments here. I recommend to be in good cooperation with neurologists because from uh, neuroprotective therapy. B group vitamins and lots of other medication to protect nerve system, antidepressants, pain medicine, good. Uh, firstly, patients should treat pain. Effective pain control is the most important thing in neuropathy, and nowadays we have lots of opportunities to treat pain. From uh, simple uh, anal uh, medication to special nerve blocks. And is there any, any um, treatment which help um, for nerves to regrow or to improve anyhow? Uh, it depends on the reason of neuropathy. Of course, it's better to address this question to neurological society because what's about autoimmune neuropathy? Transplantation is the best option for now. Uh, what about uh, symptoms control? Uh, lots of medication which are available, for example, low dose naltrexone, painkillers, morphine group, tramadol group, combination with antidepressants. But of course, if patient has pain, patient has to use very good pain control medicine. And of course, if the reason of neuropathy, for example, diabetes mellitus. Uh, so it's impo it's quite important to treat diabetes mellitus. Treating in diabetes, we can improve neuropathy. Thank you very much. You are I welcome. appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a lovely bye -bye. day. Have Thank a you. Bye bye. Day. bye bye. So, doctor, thank it, you so much for it, details. It was quite neurological question. <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway, it happens, and uh, that's good that we can give any reply, maybe any direction where people Absolutely. have to go. Absolutely, I think we try, we, we help. I think we help. We hope. <laughs> uh, so, doctor, you know, one lady, she can't uh, call and to ask, but she texted me her question. If you don't mind, I I'm will ready. read it. Yeah, so look, uh, mom of patient uh, ask me so the lady young lady she has a mess relapsing remitting and she was diagnosed just one month ago so what's the problem she doesn't want to send documents our application to our hospital or any hospital for treatment because uh one doctors on one side, uh, they told her that she will go to menopause and will not able to have kids after that treatment. Another thing, other doctors in other places that lesions will have some kind of black holes, so maybe kind of damages. Also, after the treatment, she will have worsening symptoms. No, other doctors, unfortunately, she didn't tell what exact doctors, but unfortunately, she has such bad recommendation about transplantation. So, please, she ask. Uh, she is afraid of her daughter. She her DSS of the patient only one point five, so quite low for now. And of course, uh, her mom is worried about her future. What can we recommend? Uh, what to do? She's afraid she doesn't understand correctly where is it true. Uh, okay. Uh, very good question. So, because lots of no, discussion with neurologists about understanding when to do this treatment. And our long experience, not only our hospital, American Richard Bird's long experience and European colleagues' long experience shows that the earlier we do this treatment, the better. Uh, as I told before, answering some other questions, uh, if we provide, if we give modern protocol of transplantation, it's totally safe for fertility. We have lots of patients who 
had successful pregnancies delivered successfully after transplantation without any problems. Sometimes we recommend if patient is going to have children, we recommend to provide excrea preservation. This is quite common practice, not only in transplantation area, but before starting traditional treatment, sometimes crea preservation is quite a good option because traditional treatment also can affect fertility. Risk mm -hmm. to have problem here after transplantation less than 0.5%. Uh, what about black holes? Black holes, it means that patient had MS not one month, but longer. Black holes, this is a kind of cyst. This is dyed nerve cells, empty space in brain. So because each MS has a cult phase and then clinical phase. So, of course, one month of official diagnosis, but MS is quite longer, and blood holes means that patient uh, had MS, I think, longer than one year. Mm -hmm. But what is the most important in early stage to make the right decision? Important to understand, does patient have lesions in spine in the beginning? I mean neck and thorax, cervix spine and thorax spine MRI. This MRI is very important because... If patient has lesions in spine in the beginning, risk of quick progression is very high. And this is additional information to apply for treatment quickly, as soon as possible, because risk of progression is higher than in group of patients who have lesions only in brain. Mm -hmm. So this information gives us like a key to make decision. So, I have lesions in spine, I need to do something quickly, because my MS can be much quicker than other MS. MS is quite unpredictable. Sometimes it's slow, sometimes slow and then quick, sometimes aggressive in the beginning. Difficult to predict, but lesions in spine is an unfavorable factor for prognosis if you don't give effective treatment. So, another thing, uh, mom of this patient can send us information, for example, MRI report or medical documents. We can discuss it separately, privately, no problems. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, doctor. And um, I totally agree with you. Maybe I want to add a little bit from my side. So it's not a secret that I am MS patient in my past also, and I did it in the beginning of my MS and 10 years ago oh, has gone already. <laughs> so I agree, of course, to do it as soon as possible. And please uh, maybe talk with your daughter to talk with us like, together. Don't <laughs> mind. And uh, and um, what else? I'm a mom also one year ago. So, so all good. After treatment, I have baby. All good. Please. Uh, I uh, hope my example can help. <laughs> uh, absolutely agree. Because I want to add that you had aggressive variant of MS. And we yes, did it in time. And I had it in here as well. So Why? no more comments, no more comments. <laughs> Look at this result. Yeah, please. This is much better than We're MRI. Ready to help. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, I don't do it for the last five years. Oh, good. <laughs> so, okay, uh, let's continue, doctor. We have another lady, Dorothy. She also wants to ask you some question, and I hope she is ready because we maybe talk a lot <laughs> now. Uh, let's wait for her. She has had treatment. Okay. Hello, Hello Dorothy. You. Nice to see you. How are you? Yes, I'm fine. Uh, my progression had stopped. You know, I had a primary progressive MS and also lesions in my spine. And since the two years, uh, I had uh, HSET uh, for two years um, in Moscow and... Um, Wonderful result. I, I am even walking better now. Um, uh, so I'm very grateful that I could do the um, treatment at P Pirogov Hospital. But now I have a question. Um, before transplantation, I had repression 
depression and weakness of drive and fatigue. When I left the hospital, my weakness of drive and repression was gone. I was very happy because the quality of my life was much better. But after two weeks, uh, I left hospital, the weakness of drive and depression came slowly back and uh, it remains until now. Uh, so, um, my first question is, why did weakness of drive and repression um, went away uh, shortly after treatment and then came back? Um, uh, so I understand your question. Mm -hmm. Very important question. Okay, firstly, uh, thank you very much for information. Your uh, examples are very impressive because, uh, as you know, lots of discussions that transplantation can't be effective for primary progressive MS. To be honest, a part of transplantation, no one medication, traditional treatment can help in case of primary progressive MS. MS. Only transplantation has a chance to stop it. And the main idea of this treatment to save patient from complete disability. When, uh, if it's possible, to improve quality of life. During transplantation, we give very uh, strong uh, protective treatment to go through the chemotherapy without any problems, like steroids and other. And this medication covers one, two, three months after transplantation. So this is why you were better, because it was a result of supportive therapy. Then, of course, your symptoms came back. You are MS-free now. And what we did? Before transplantation, you had MS. MS is a bad, aggressive T and B cells. And another thing, lesions MS did before treatment. We, unfortunately, we can't treat, can't repair nerves. This is why the earlier we do this treatment, the better. We remove these aggressive cells. You were better because of protection therapy in early period after transplantation, and later you started to feel all damage MS did before this treatment. What we should do in situation like yours? Unfortunately, uh, we, have, uh, we don't have enough support in neurological society, but lots of me there are lots of medication which can help you with these symptoms and to improve your symptoms. When I, uh, when we discussed during my presentation, you can find uh, rule three of success. Good supportive treatment after transplantation in early and late period. This is pro proper rehabilitation, psychological support, sleep problems treatment. For example, yoga, art, music therapy in this period. And good symptoms control using medication. Lots of medication to treat fatigue, starting from uh, like modafinil, uh, low-dose naltrexone. This treatment not for MS, this treatment to improve symptoms. And you should discuss with your family doctor if you have good relationship with your neurologist what to use to treat your fatigue. Modafinil, low-dose naltrexone, uh, some supplements and vitamins can help you. But what is the most important? To have proper physical activity. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> we covered a um, very important topic, uh, support after transplantation. Yes. Yeah. So, unfortunately, when patient leaves our hospital, lots of people don't find good uh, communication with neurological team, with supportive doctors. We try to help, but uh, of course, uh, the best way is to be in close cooperation with your medical team. 
uh, I am ready, I'm open, so you can contact me with your doctor. We will discuss what to do to help to improve your quality of life. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you very much for You're your welcome. answer. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much, our friends again, and doctor for your quite a detailed explanation. So, doctor, we have another lady, Melanie, she wants also to ask you some questions. She also had uh, treatment in our hospital, and I hope we can uh, again to help to coordinate her. I am ready. Good. Hi, Melanie. Hi, Dr. Federig. Nice Hi. to see you. Hi, Anastasia. Nice to see you too. How are you? How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm fine, okay. thank you. I'm much, good. much better. Great, yeah. great. Very, very good. Um, I've started working again and my uh, EDSS score has gone down. Great. Yeah, some of my old damages uh, has repaired, so I'm so happy. Great. I'm so, so Great. happy, yeah. Uh, my questions for you is, um, do you have some knowledge about uh, further treatment for re remyelation therapies or treatment post-treatment? Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is very important uh, treatment because uh, many patients apply and end in late stage of the disease with lots of yeah. lesions and remyelination. This is future. There are some clinical trials from uh, Tavigil and other medication, uh, vitamin supplements, cellular therapy to uh, improve remyelination. But unfortunately, no one proved medication for it. So this is why the earlier we stop aggressive process, out aggressive process, the more we save, yeah. the less we need to repair. Nowadays, yeah. we have uh, only one good approach, early transplantation. Another thing for patients with advanced disease, proper rehabilitation, our body can improve lots of uh, we have big potential, we have uh, lots of insight of our body to improve. Uh, if patient has high disability level after transplantation, what is the most important? Uh, proper rehabilitation, physiotherapy, yeah. good symptoms control, psychological support, positive mind. All these factors can improve remyelination and ability our body to repair nerves. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, maybe cellular uh, cellular therapy is another future, but uh, we need at least five ten years, like uh, T regular cells and mesenchymal cells and uh, some other cells. Uh, Richard Bird in Ch from Chicago provides lots of research about reparation, but this is only laboratory tests. Okay, so, so it's. It's in the future. Yeah. This is future. Okay. This is future, yeah. but now we can stop it and to provide good supportive treatment after transplantation and, of course, wait for future uh, developing of uh, remyelination uh, programs. Okay. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for very, very good question. Have a nice evening. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you so much. We hope really in future we can find something more interesting, super medications. Why not? <laughs> it I would hope, be nice. Yes. <laughs> it would be nice. So, my dear doctor, we have another guy, Manuel. He also wants to ask you some questions. Uh, let's do it. Emmanuel, let's do please it. welcome. Hello. Hello, Hello Emmanuel. Yes, I, I'm a woman. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> oh my <laughs> dear, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Can you see me? I'm not sure. Oh, this okay, works. I don't yes, see you, you but see I can me. hear you. Okay. Oh, how come? I'm trying. I can see myself. Okay, say. So, oh, okay. oh, hi, nice. hi, hello, hello nice to hello. see you. Thank you. I'm hello. very happy to be able to speak to you tonight. Uh, me well, too. Thank you. I'm 56. And I'm suffering of a secondary progressive MS. 
It has been diagnosed three years ago uh, together with a hernia, which has been operated. And since then, the disease isn't, well, the MS is not active. I do not have new lesions. However, uh, after the operation, my e uh, EDSS uh, became six. So now I'm wondering if I can't see you anymore. When I, I, I'm wondering if um, uh, the, the transplantation would help in my case, and what can I expect from it? Okay, uh, that's my first question. I have okay, a second question after. It. Okay. Okay. Firstly, uh, thank you very much. We discussed the same questions from one gentleman who had MS yes. symptoms but stable MRI. Uh, firstly, you have good chance for transplantation because, uh, according my result, our results in our presentation, patients with disease duration less than five years have better results than longer disease cause. Another thing, uh, uh, general anesthesia and surgery is a big stress for body, and it can mm. be a trigger of MS progression. But mm. uh, if you had a disc surgery, it's good because indication for disc surgery is compression. Yeah. We removed compression, and now if you are without any compression, without any negative things after surgery, and you still have progression, this progression is a result of MS. It yeah. doesn't matter. And do you have they left vision? A little, so, I'm sorry. They left a little bit of the hernia in the in the spine. They couldn't take it off totally. But they removed uh, compression, yes? No, yes, they removed compression, yeah. If they remove compression and you still have progression, firstly, what I recommend you, you need to visit your neurosurgeries to understand are you okay after surgery. We need to explain uh, why you are getting worse. Because of disc problem or maybe some complications after surgery or because of MS. If neurosurgeries told you that your okay, surgery was good, no side effects, and you still have symptoms, and you are getting worse, worse, and worse, so another explanation is MS progression. For secondary progressive and for primary progressive MS, is quite typical not to have visual, visual changes on MRI. Yeah, right. So this is why MS can be active clinically, but stable of an MRI, because MRI is limited to detect minimal changes in spine or minimal changes in gray matter. Or so. So it's better to do it. It's better to do it, but of course, when you visit our hospital, we provide careful examination. You will have MRI, if you, uh, brain and total spine with contrast. If you need, we will ask our neurosurgeries to give to, to provide consultation. Also, Thank you. We, yeah. we have very good neurosurgeries department, and also we have special department specialized on disc problems, so we can ask our specialist uh, to give our opinion about your situation mm. and we usually do it before starting transplantation to make the right decision. If you ah, see you. that your problem isn't related to MS and you need surgery again, we address you to neurosurgical service or give you recommendation what to do at home. Okay, but is it included in the rate? In the yes. In this situation, okay, it's you. included. Thank you. Another question. Uh, I'm afraid about the the chemotherapy. Is it? Is it? I mean, can it, if, uh, is it dangerous for somebody? Uh, is it toxic? Completely not. First advice: you should change name, not chemotherapy, which associated with cancer. Uh, yeah. Name it immunosuppressive therapy or okay. MS killing therapy. It's it's much better. MS, MS healing. healing. <laughs> so, but uh, actually, modern protocol is quite safe. 
zero mortality rate and no intensive care unit department uh, treatment. Uh, we have more than big group of patients, so quite safe. Maybe safer than traditional treatment. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I never received any treatment anyway. They no, didn't give me for, any treatment. For transplantation, is very it's very good. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. So probably around. I'll see you probably in March. Great. See you. Thank you. I'm uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Manolin. I apologize. <laughs> I thought that you're a guy. <laughs> so, uh, doctor, we have another a nice lady, Orsia. She has discharged just a few weeks ago, but mm -hmm. she is again with us. It's very nice. We remember her very well. <laughs> and uh, I hope she is with us now and she wants to ask you some questions. That's really good. Would be nice. <laughs> anyway. Yes, I'm happy. Yeah, we wait, but maybe some problem. She is from Australia, and to be honest, right now it's maybe in about three a.m. If I'm right. Oh, to yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll see if our connection is working. But Very strong. No, maybe not. My motivate. Yeah, but something with uh, connection, maybe. No, okay. Anyway, we will reply on her question later by email, phone, Absolutely. and anyway, we are in contact again. Just want to repeat, maybe, and for others that we are in contact after treatment, not any problem at all. So, doctor, you know, I have uh, also some short questions from our uh, really, really big friend from Brooks League. She is uh, one of our administrators of our uh, group on Facebook. She uh, has had also transplantation in our hospital. And, uh, you know, I was lucky in one day I was in America and we met her face to face because we had transplantation in different years. So it's really nice. Uh, unfortunately, she can't uh, take part today in our uh, webinar, but she sent me uh, some questions. So, doctor, just uh, a little bit more time, <laughs> please. Um... Yes, I am ready. Uh, okay, let's so, go. On. Yeah. Uh, how long uh, does isolation usually take time? Mm -hmm. For how long? How many days? So, it's quite, uh, it depends on uh, individual situation, but usually it varies from six to nine, ten days maximum, usually mm -hmm. seven to eight. So I remember Brooks Leak, our uh, amazing lady from the USA with aggressive variant of MS with high activity level and transplantation was performed many years ago. And do you remember one hour webinar when Brooke broke on her stick? No, yeah, maybe something oh, I remember about threw it. threw <laughs> it away, something like this. I remember it. It was amazing experience. Ah, nice. <laughs> I, I really, maybe I don't remember right, right now, but I trust that it happened. <laughs> so, the doctor, another type of question. Um, what type of catheter do you use? Can you give more details? Is it to neck, arms, subclavian? Uh, now we use a uh, Jaguar neckline catheter, very good American catheters, quite small, quite thin, and installation of this catheter is very safe. It takes 10 minutes, so we have good anesthesiologist, so nothing to worry about it. Catheter oh, is yeah. quite safe, very good catheters, American, and <laughs> we put it in a uh, Jaguar vein in neck. Yeah, and maybe one important thing, uh, dear friends, you don't feel pain. First injection only and uh, all neck, I mean, all that place will be numb. <laughs> you will not feel pain. It's Maybe it looks uh, painful, but not in the real. <laughs> like, uh, like when injection only here. Yes, yes, I agree. I had it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, another question, doctor. Uh, uh, how many days should a uh, patient expect to stay in the hospital? It takes usually 28, 30 days. So okay, okay. if uh, we have previous patient's result, so mm -hmm. if you don't need to provide additional examination and, and, or treatment, uh, other diseases like comorbidities, like gallbladder removing, so usually it takes around one month, 28, 30 days. Oh, I think we have someone to call, yeah? Just we will try to maybe connect again with Orsi if it's possible. 
Uh, it would be nice. That would be great because I hear her sometimes, <laughs> but no, uh, some again Let's this go. connection. Let's go so, doctor, yeah, no, look, uh, just uh, to be honest, some questions for me, and I wanted to ask to sorry yeah. to reply. Uh, so, look, uh, one other question: Is it obligatory to have? Um, Uh, to have uh, someone with you for treatment, I mean, uh, any caregiver. Yeah, it's possible that you come to Moscow with your relatives, with someone, but it's not obligatory if you can't. I mean, not a problem at all if you come alone for treatment. Our team will help and support for all time of treatment. So not obligatory. Don't worry about that part if it's too difficult. Uh, another thing about um, air tickets, airline tickets, if you have to book, yeah, I also coordinate if you have questions. Usually people arrive in Moscow at the same date of admission. I would rather meet you anytime in any airport and bring to the hospital. It's not a problem. And usually uh, patients book a return ticket at the same time. That's also much better because in the end of your treatment, sometimes it happens that uh, there are no tickets. So it's better to book. It's better uh, to do it yeah. before ahead. I agree. Yeah. So I think uh, most questions uh, we have already done and uh, we have replied. If you wanted to add doctor something. Oh. Oh, Orsia, that's nice. Hi. Uh, we see nice you. Nice to see you. Yeah, How are cool. you? <laughs> Good morning, how are you? You look happy. <laughs> I am very happy, Fredorenko. Uh, I'm going to tell it was a month. No, it is a month today. Uh, Great. That I Congratulations. The uh, yes. And um, you had yeah. very long and difficult trip, jet lag from Moscow to Australia, but you look fresh. Yes, I woke up at uh, four o'clock to hear you. Oh, <laughs> so nice. Uh, and uh, just uh, a short one. I am feeling already improvement. Uh, I, my husband seeing my improvements, tiny, minor ones. My physiotherapist, my doctors noticing it. So it's amazing. And... And I just do have one question about uh, when I can go back to socialize. My uh, blood count, WCC, went back to normal, even it went a little bit above. Um, and I wonder if it's a problem, if it went a bit, little bit above, and how do I know when I can uh, start socializing again with my beautiful hair? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see you can give this information directly right now. I, I, uh, you sent me your results. Your leukocytes level is normal, a little bit higher, but lymphocytes level is a little bit down, but it's quite normal in one to three months after lymphoblative protocol, yes? Uh, the lim lymphocyte is okay. Uh, oh, so the, you, are, you have very quick recovery, it's good. You can start your social life now, but what I recommend, in spite of, in spite of normal values, first three months patient is usually more sensitive to virus infection because okay. subgroups, subpopulations of lymphocytes which can be detected you using uh, ordinary test usually based on experience less than normal so you can do all you can follow your normal life only wear mask in crowded places at least two months no other restrictions Understand. you can go out you Understand. can meet friends you can go to public places no restrictions So start thank right you very now. Much for and thank you for your feedback. You. I am really happy to see you in one month. And just to know that after a long flight, after difficult trip, you are very good and you have early improvement thank right you. now. It's amazing. Good luck, dear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Bye. Bye.
It's so nice that finally we could connect it. (laughs) That's right. That's cool. Good example of quick recovery. Exactly, doctor. So maybe uh, for last question dear, for you today, dear doctor. So uh, look, it's also a good question to be honest. I sorry again read it uh, because uh, patients can't connect uh, to okay, us. Okay, let's, let's do so, it. No problems. Uh, so if relapse happens after transplantation, uh, so what can we recommend? What to do? And uh, is it Always uh, a question about second transplantation or not. So what can you say, doctor, about that case? Okay. okay, I presented our new developments uh, in my presentation and I want to repeat because this is very important questions. Success oh, yeah. rate Maybe of trans- more details. Uh, Uh, success rate of transplantation, depending on the variant of MS, uh, is from uh, 75 to 95%. So Of course, some people relapse, have relapse or progression, and we need to help in this situation. So this is why we developed protocol of second transplantation. We can do it if patient has relapsed more than one year after first transplantation. Usually, relapse takes place in longer than one year mm-hmm. after one year. So second transplantation option using another chemotherapy and chemotherapy through the lumbar puncture inside of central nerve system mm-hmm. is very effective. And we have this experience. Our f- results not published yet are very good. So also there is another option, anti-B cell therapy like rituximab for people who can't go for second transplantation. So this is a good option. And another important issue, we discuss CAR-T therapy, mm-hmm. which we are developing in our hospital. And I think in the next year, we will treat, we will provide small clinical trial uh, treating our Russian patients. We are going to treat five Russian patients using modern approach of CAT therapy. And we are going to treat mm-hmm. patients who relapsed after transplantation. So CAT therapy is another future possibility to take the disease under control. This is mm-hmm. future. No one MS patient treated for CAT therapy. I think we will be the first hospital who is going to do it. And uh, we are developing very, very unique approach for CAT therapy uh, together with our immunological team, not like in lupus or not like against CD90 uh, cells, but a special approach affecting deep mechanism of MS using special molecules, the regulatory cells, to remove MS from patient's body. But we will start from uh, with patients who relapsed after transplantation. And this is another possible future option for this situation. So, good question. Uh, yes, nice, nice. Okay, thank you so much for so many details. So, doctor, we, uh, I think, has done for today, for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we have replied on all questions, no, most of them. So, maybe um, uh, thank you so much, our dear friends, for your again time, your cooperation. Thank you again. We wish you Merry Christmas and Happy New Year soon. <laughs> uh, dear fr- Anastasia, dear friends, thank you very much. Uh, finally, I am really happy to uh, have good talk. Good talk. Lots of very use- useful and wise questions. I'm thinking that our friends understand much more than lots of neurologists in this yeah. problem. <laughs> and other doctors. <laughs> and so, and uh, now we are, fire, as a conclusion, now we are analyzing our big database, more than 1,200 patients with very long follow-up. So uh, I I am going to make a report in 50-year anniversary uh, EBMT conference in April, Next yeah, we year. hope it will happen. So maybe it will happen. <laughs> so if we have uh, our results, and uh, we will organize a new webinar, not in the end of 2024, but maybe closer to summertime, 
May, June uh, to present our big update information about uh, big group of people, new updated information about our new lymphoblative protocol and maybe first information about CAT technology we are going, we are developing in our hospital. So to be honest, not our hospital, only our hospital developing CAT technology because this is very uh, modern technology and we uh, work in cooperation with another two big universities of Moscow to provide, to develop a very effective and modern treatment. Um, I think it will be the first CAT therapy for MS. But let's see. And also I... Uh, I am very thankful, oh, Anastasia, for you and for all our friends and dear friends. Uh, have a nice night, evening, day, morning, <laughs> depending on time. And Merry yeah. Christmas and Happy New Year. Let's go ahead. Let's go. Bye-bye, dear friends. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> So, Amy, what about your trip to Russia? You got all the bags packed? Uh, well, uh... I think she's still not sure. Oh. Well, at least I did my best to persuade her to reconsider, but yes, the bags are packed. Amanda, I just don't get it. We've got all these wonderful doctors. You get all the medication you need. What's the point of going that far from home? Mum, you see, the thing is... Yeah, we do receive therapy here, but... You know your daughter, Melinda. She says the new method they use in Russia can stop the disease for a long time. I have made the decision. I am not going to change my mind. You know your daughter. If she sets her mind on something... I guess so. Let's talk to our reporter down there. Hello? Can you hear us in Newcastle? Oh! Oh! Uh, I'm sorry. I got it. I... David, hello. It all started when my flight landed in Moscow. Um, no, not really. It might have begun when I first saw my hands tremble. Or when I bought my first wheelchair. When I first felt my husband getting colder to me. Dear passengers, this is your captain speaking. Welcome to Moscow. On behalf of the crew, I thank you for choosing our airline and wish you a pleasant stay in Russia. They say multiple sclerosis is not a death sentence. Of course it's not. We keep living every day, getting worse, losing our loved ones who are normal. We smile. We have to pretend to be happy and smile at everyone in order for people to be pleased enough to help us. MS is not a death sentence, no, not at all. It's a lifelong torture that has no end. Or does it? This is Jones. Welcome to Moscow. I'm Alex. I emailed you a couple of days ago. Oh, uh, hi, Alex. Yeah, I remember. It's so nice to meet you. Um, you may call me Amy. How was your flight, Amy? Oh, quite all right. Just uh, feeling a bit tired, you know. Okay. Don't worry. Uh, I'll be in charge of all of your arrangements here. Sounds good. Thank you. I'm here in Moscow and this is the airport. I just arrived and passed the passport control. It's actually way better than I expected. The guy from the clinic met me right in front of the plane. Oh, uh, here he is. Alex, say hi. Hiya. Uh, Amy, your luggage is here, so shall we go now? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Excellent. The worst part of living with a mess is 
the progression. Doctors know how to slow it down. You will get medication, treatments and stuff, but... Anyway, for many of us, a wheelchair and total dependency on loved ones is the only future we can expect. Dependency. This is what scares me the most. we'll head straight to the hospital. Uh, we still have time to be the traffic, so we'll go through the city centre so that you can see the nice views of oh. Moscow in summer. Okay. I'm sure you'll love it. Yeah, sure. Multiple sclerosis does not only affect your physical condition. It affects all aspects of your life, in fact. Over just a year since I was diagnosed, I've gone from a cheerful, independent and attractive woman into an object of compassion, a daily burden for the people I love. I've come to Moscow to get a radical treatment for my MS and, hopefully, get my life back. There are very few clinics in the world that do this kind of treatment. A hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Doctors will destroy my immune system that causes a mess and make my body create a new healthy one. It was a difficult decision though. To go to a foreign country for several weeks, take chemotherapy, and face all the adverse effects. But if there is a chance, isn't it worth taking? Welcome to the clinic. This will be your home for the next couple of weeks, and meet Anastasia. She will look after you now. Mm. Hello, sweet. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Anastasia. How are you doing? Oh, uh, I'm good, thanks. My dear, this is our floor. Hope you will remember. I'll try. And your room. Welcome, please. Thank you. Not so big, but I hope it will be fine for you for a few weeks. You will stay here. So uh -huh. maybe I introduce you a little bit. So okay. tomorrow doctor will come. Now you have your dinner. Nurse will bring food to your room and uh, let's do it. Yeah, let's. Hello, Amy. Hello. Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Did you have a good trip? Um, yeah, of course I did. My name is Dr. Denis Fedorenko. My colleagues it. and I will get you through all the stages of HCT treatment. I suppose you know how the treatment works, don't you? Well, yes, I do, in uh, general terms. Our goal is to reboot your immune system. As you know, it doesn't work properly now and it attacks your own nerve cells. Right. Firstly, we will eliminate the cause of your disease, the aggressive immune system, using high-dose chemotherapy. And after it, we will transplant your own stem cells to rebuild new, properly working immune system. High-dose chemotherapy and stem cell transplantation sounds pretty terrifying, though. Yes, Amy, I understand you. This treatment isn't a piece of cake. You should do some effort and you will have time to recover. Um, will the treatment really get me back my normal life? I mean, will I walk out of your clinic as a healthy person? At the same time, it depends on your own efforts. 
uh, your support, your family's support and treatment effectiveness. Amy, I understand your doubts. I know that you are worried. But look at the other side. This treatment has proven in cases much more difficult than yours. Everything will be okay. I think we will fight your disease. Sounds cheering. This is transplantation scheme. Firstly, we need to mobilize and to collect stem cells. We use special medication to stimulate stem cells. And then we use special collection machine like a harvesting machine or a pheresis machine to collect stem cells and to provide deep freezing. After this stage, we provide high dose chemotherapy. This is the most important stage because we can remove wrong immune system. It takes from four to six days. After this, we will give stem cells back and you will have seven to eight days time for recovery. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it together. Hey folks. It's been a while since I was last online. I'm nearly done here, and doctors say the treatment was a success. Pretty soon they're going to let me go home. Oh, Ginny, I have news for you too. Remember you had concerns about pregnancy? I met a young woman who works here in the clinic. She's pregnant and it looks like she's about to give birth any day now. She told me she had MS just like you and me and that she got the same AHCT treatment here 10 years ago. So, here we go. And the doctor said the treatment method has actually become safer over the years and it does not affect fertility in any way. Hope I've answered your question. Haven't I? So Hugh, are you going to watch the King's Address to the Parliament tonight? Uh, will it be at live? Um, I guess I'll be at work. Not sure if I can watch TV in my office, you know. It's alright, I'll let you know if it's worthy. By the way, where is Amy? She'll be here in a minute. She was at the doctor's. Doctors? Yeah, she has an ingrown toenail. Oh. I'm home. Here she is. Let me help you, honey. Do you mind here? No, no, no. I'll do it. I'll take it, darling. I hope you won't take it.